Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick to the Come video, let's discuss Vega, shall we? AMD have confirmed that the graphics architecture is on track to launch Q2, and according to them, it has been designed from scratch to address most data and visually intensive next generation workloads with key architecture advancements. But that's not really the purpose of this video. While it's nice to know that yes, the GPU is still on track for Q2, and frankly, at this point, I just want an actual release date, the main purpose of this video is actually to address the leak which has just happened in regards to a Linux patch. So, Vega, we've known some kind of ambiguous details about the GPU, primarily the fact that Vega 10, which is what this video is going to really focus upon, is going to have 4096 stream processors or shaders or whatever you want to call it. There have been a few other details that AMD have leaked, for example, released themselves. For example, the fact it's going to have up to 8 gigabytes of HBM2 memory. That's for the customer side of things. We'll get into that more in just a moment. And 4 gigabytes will be available for some GPUs if the partner, in other words, if the MSIs, if the ASUSs or whomever want to reduce that version, they can certainly do so. But a lot of the really key parts of the graphics card have been very ambiguous until now. So let's talk about the architecture from a very high level. So first things first, AMD Vega 10 will feature 64 next generation compute units. Each of these contains 64 stream processors. So if you take 64 times 64, of course you come up with uh, 4096. Then you divide those by four. So in short, you have 4096, you divide it by 4, and that means you have 1024. So in short, those represent a shader engine. Each shader engine has two asynchronous compute units. For those who don't know asynchronous compute units on AMD architecture, reference the ability, or rather the component in the GPU, which allows the graphics work to be scheduled along with compute work. So for example, it can tell... Uh, the graphics card or rather the shaders, hey, I need you to schedule in this compute work right here, which might be, for example, I don't know, calculating lighting or physics or whatever, and then go back to scheduling something else. It can basically help to prioritize workloads. Then you have one render backend and four texture blocks. Once again, render backends are comprised of multiple uh, ROPs. So there are 16 ROPs meaning total 64 ROPs across the GPU, because each backend has 16 ROPs. 16 times 4 is 64 ROPs. Now, ROPs are also rather important, especially on high-end graphics cards. Their purpose is to basically assemble the scene. While the purpose of this video isn't to necessarily take you through the graphics pipeline or the graphics architecture of a modern-day graphics card, I do want to set some of the scene on, if you excuse the pun, on how this works. A ROP, or raster processor, has the simple job of constructing a scene, adding certain visual effects, and basically this will then be sent to the graphics card. It's basically stored in different buffers, the front or the back buffer. Once it's sent, the next image will be sent, and the next image will be sent. A large number of ROPs means that, well, the GPU just has more ability to render higher resolution images, which of course, in the case of a high-end graphics card, is kind of important. No one's buying Vega 10 ultimately to play in 720p or 1080p or perhaps even 1440p. Most of us are probably looking at it and thinking, gee, that would look pretty nice on my 4K television. Similarly, there are four texture blocks per each of these engines. Now, the texture blocks themselves are comprised of 16 texture units, uh, texture mapping units. So that means you have 256 total. Now, texture mapping units is pretty self-explanatory. They, of course, well, map textures. Once again, a larger number of these is very important when we're dealing with higher resolution textures. A lot of games now actually have textures, even when you're running the game at higher resolution, they still have only resolutions of like... 1080p or what have you for the actual textures. But this probably won't be the case in about a year or so because Scorpio will be released. The PlayStation 4 Pro will have a lot more development time worked on. And we're talking, of course, of cross-platform here. 
um, cross-platform development, it means that developers can spend a lot more time creating high-resolution textures because they know it's going to work across or be available to a larger group of individuals. In other words, if they create a 4K texture, they know it's most likely going to be at least pretty well received on the Scorpio, pretty well received on the PS4 Pro, and pretty well received on the PC. Finally, Vega 10 also supports eight independent work threads. What does this mean? It means basically the GPU is better at handling multi-threading. Now, Things get a little stickier when we're dealing with how Vega stacks up and also Vega 11. <laughs> Frankly, we know very little about Vega 11. What we do know is there are two distinctive device IDs that have been spotted with Vega. The first four letters remain the same. They are 687F. Um, the difference is, however, you have C1 and CF. That's where things get a little weird, because in the case of, oh, I don't know, Doom, most of the time we're seeing the GPU running with a certain device ID, but other leaks would have C3. So, for example, most of the Doom demos we've seen has had C1. What we can probably make an educated guess on, although it's only a guess, so it could possibly be completely and utterly bogus, Generally, lower numbers, at least in AMD's uh, lineup, in terms of when they're creating the cards, in other words, the engineering names, generally refer to the higher performance part. So, for example, Vega 10 is higher performance than Vega 11. It's not because they're weird, it's just because you can think of it as like version 1, version 1.2, version 1.3. They're basically creating the high-end GPU first and then basically making variants of that card. So that's a bit like why Polaris 10 is a more powerful graphics card than Polaris 11 or Polaris 12. It just is kind of how it works. And it's kind of similar as well for NVIDIA, like GP104 is higher than GP106, for its sake of argument. So we can therefore make an assumption that the C1 variant is the more powerful, but does that mean C3 is Vega, Ele uh, Vega 11? Well, we just don't know. It's possible that it is, or it's possible it's just cut down. But I am getting somewhat off topic. What we do know about the graphics card, and this is based upon another version of Radeon um, Vega, and that is the MI25. Now, that's Radeon Instinct, and that is for professional use, but still, the card does run at a clock speed of about 1.5 gigahertz. We know that because A, the name... Um, and B, well, you know, other leaks. So MO25 refers to the half precision performance. In other words, it has 25 T flops of FP16. So if you half that, so you have full precision performance, is around 12.5. Therefore, we can make some assumptions that Vega is probably, and I refer, of course, to the high end Vega, probably has a clock speed of around 15 to 1600 megahertz. I say around because ultimately we don't know exactly. It's possible it could be higher than that, but whenever someone asks me, I generally say it's probably got around 1550 megahertz clock speed. And this is assuming, of course, there's no factory overclocking or anything else under the sun. Moving on to the memory side of things, although this is possibly one of the more understood parts of the graphics card, and that is that the GPU does, of course, have HPM2. It's a bit ambiguous, however, how memory is going to really be usable on Vega. I don't mean that, you know, there's some segmented amount of RAM which is held back or anything like that. I just mean that certain partners will presumably allow 4 gigabytes to be purchasable by the end user. Although 8 gigabytes is looking to be the average for the customer. In other words, a retail customer. Now, while that's not confusing by itself, that's pretty standard, it's been like that since the dawn of time, AMD are looking to change the focus of the conversation, this is their words, not mine, from amount of RAM to bandwidth. So that basically means it's not really the amount of memory that you have on your graphics card, it's the amount of RAM which is actually usable by an application, and similarly how much application, how much that application actually needs. And they've released a couple of examples, and I'm sure you've all seen them, which pertain to games like The Witcher, and how much it's actually allocating versus how much the actual application is really, in reality, using, running at 4K. 
I don't honestly know how it's going to work in reality because, quite frankly, 4 gigabytes of memory seems a little small. Maybe not now. I'm sure it's going to be fine for the games like The Witcher. But in one year's time, two years time, I'm a little dicey whether 4 gigabytes is going to be enough, quite frankly. Honestly, the conversations regarding the amount of RAM on the board is something that we can only really make educated opinions on and start forming those as a basis as a reviewer or as a community once the graphics cards have been released. I can certainly spout lyrically about the, my conversations with AMD, including Scott Wasson, but ultimately I kind of want to test that stuff by myself with games of which are slightly older, like, for example, The Witcher, I'm not saying it's ancient by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, older games, as well as future games, and also discuss other bits and pieces. For example, in reality, what's going to be the benefits of rapid pet math for draw stream binning or primitive shaders? Most of this stuff, if you're unfamiliar with it, is there for a couple of reasons. One, because it's great marketing, and also, of course, because it offers, in theory, optimizations and better performance. For example, rapid pack math and draw stream binning and primitive shaders, uh, to name just a few cool things, will allow the GPU to do a lot more work for the same number of cycles. In the case of, let's say, rapid pack math, you get the ability to um, essentially increase the amount of calculations that the GPU can take. We've seen a couple of demonstrations of this with AMD's Tress of X, which of course allows realistic uh, hair rendering. It basically doubles the amount of performance. There are an awful lot of other discussions we can have with Vega, but quite frankly, we've had a number of them in the past, and I think we're all at the point now where we want to see something very tangible. We want to see the performance of the graphics card, and I don't necessarily believe the, uh, the leaks in performance, or more specifically the latest one, which tells us that Vega is only around as fast as the GTX 1070. That isn't to say that I think the benchmark's bogus, I just mean that, um, and for those of you who do not know, this refers to the TimeSpy benchmark, which leaked out just a couple of days ago. I said it in that video, and I'll say it in this video, there's no situational, um, there's no context behind it. So, by which I mean, what was the clock speed of Vega? Yes, we can say it's X, Y, and Z, but is it just reading it wrong? Or perhaps are the parts of the graphics card disabled? What are the drive? What's the state of the drivers? What's the state? How many shaders does it even have? Does it have all of them enabled? Does it have, for example, is it running passively? Blah, 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 blah. There's so many different aspects of the graphics card we're just unaware of at the moment. I think we can all say one thing. We want the graphics card to be damn well released, which I think we're pretty happy about, you know, knowing that it's going to be released pretty soon, at least according to what AMD are telling us. Finally, as long as it's about on par with the expectation versus reality of Ryzen, I think we're all going to be pretty happy. Like Ryzen, I said it before and I'll say it again, I never expected Ryzen to be perfect. It was obvious that there was going to be inherent weaknesses with the CPU, particularly because it was, well, an entire new architecture. For heaven's sake, Kaby Lakes had issues. As a reviewer, I can tell you that straight off the bat. And I had to actually, actually update because we've got a Kaby Lake review coming pretty soon. Uh, with actually a really nice motherboard, um, an MSI Pro Carbon, really nice board. It really is. It, it made me very sad that we have to send it back. It's a really nice um, two, a Z270 board. So if you are looking for an Intel build and you're looking for high end, obviously it's not a cheap board. Then I can heartily recommend that. And we actually had to update the BIOS because MSI's, along with a lot of other manufacturers, Asus and several others. Their BIOSes were just pumping too much energy into the Cable Lake CPU and it was overheating, it's causing too much heat. And that's not really the BIOS manufacturer, so that's not MSI's or Asus's Pro, that's really Intel. And very similar in the case of uh, AMD. They were very conservative on launch and obviously they wanted to reduce the chances of like problems. But ultimately, we're just going to have to wait and see how all of this, uh, well, you know, progresses. With all that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.